And let's go to an Instagram question from Ashley. Can you explain Abraham's bosom in Luke 16? Uh, sure. Well, let, let's take a look at it first. Luke 16, uh, let's just read verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and said, saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. And then it goes on, Jesus goes on to, to uh, basically say that uh, there is a chasm fixed. Um, there's no going back and forth between this chasm. Um, and uh, then Lazarus says, well, and then the rich man says, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And so he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So there are two things to, to keep in mind here. First, it's a common rule of biblical interpretation that we don't draw our doctrines from parables. Uh, they're, you know, figures of speech, and uh, so we go for the more direct uh, teaching as sort of to base our doctrines on. Um, parables are parables. They, they're explosive devices. Just as Jesus gives one of his parables, the action that is revealed in the parable is actually happening on the stage. So, uh, you know, we could go through examples um, of, of how that's done, but it's, uh, y- you know, not a literal description of things, but a parable that works its way into the hearers so that those with ears to hear will believe. Uh, and stubborn opponents will become even more stubborn. Typically, the end of the parable is like the punchline to a joke. It tells us the point. And in this parable, Jesus pictures the rich man, probably a Pharisee, in Hades, begging that Lazarus, probably his friend whom he raised from the dead, bring him just a little bit of water to quench his thirst. But there's an unbridgeable chasm between heaven and Hades. Um, And then at least send Lazarus to tell my brothers what's in store for them so they'll repent. And the assumption here is that, uh, you know, if they just had more information— you know, if they just knew what was up ahead, surely they'll repent. But Jesus says, no, it's about their heart. Uh, you're underestimating the depravity of the human heart. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, then they'll repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You know, we've all probably wondered why God doesn't send some word from departed unbelievers to warn the world of the coming judgment that awaits them, Um, or if only God maybe appeared in a vision to the world, maybe on CNN, uh, told them what's up ahead. But Jesus' main point here is it wouldn't make any difference. Their hearts are so hardened that even if the religious leaders were gathered at Jesus' tomb on Easter morning— they would have refused to believe that he's the Christ. Not only did Jesus' resurrection require a miracle, it takes a miracle of God's grace for anyone to believe in him. That's Jesus' point. It's not God's failure to provide enough information. The Pharisees had plenty of information in the writings of Moses and in the prophets to lead them to Jesus, but they still rejected him. The resurrection is sufficient evidence— that Jesus is who he said he is and did for us what he did, uh, what he said he did for us. But we have only ourselves to blame for rejecting him and only God to thank for receiving him. I'll just close with John 1, 11 through 13. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, like Lazarus, who believed in his name, 
he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Mm. And the, the whole story just makes me think of all the people who say, oh, if God just gave me a mm-hmm. sign, then I'd really believe you. I mean, yeah, you're talking about the Bible and the teachings of the Bible, but, you know, God's never shown himself to me. But really, the, the scripture alone is enough. Oh. And so often, even even when we get those kinds of signs, you think about the Pharisees, even when you have that, that tangible thing right in front of you, the, the children of Israel in, in the wilderness, walking through the wilderness, seeing sign after sign after sign, even with that, we won't believe. No. It, it really has to be a work of the Spirit through the gospel. And so that's why we preach the gospel. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that question.